imagine if we could go, here's a way to just turn on all of the, the nutrition genes for all the corn plants that the poorest of the poor are growing, and we've made it basically free. Imagine if all the governments in Africa and Central America could just be like, and the, or the big companies themselves could just be like, sure, let's do that. And then boom, 1.2 billion people actually get the nutrition they need. Hello and welcome to How We Change the World podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Rowan. My guest today is Kurt Bowen, the founder and executive director of Semilla Nueva, which is Spanish for New Seed. Kurt is a um, social entrepreneur and he works to fight malnutrition in the Central American country of Guatemala. He's a philosopher at heart and also by degree, and his passion is changing the trajectory of life for the poorest of the poor on the planet, those individuals living on 2 to $3 a day. Kurt's 14-year effort in Guatemala has focused his, fo his gaze down to one tiny point, a corn seed. And while it may not make headlines today, the work Kurt is doing with corn farmers is both subtle and earth-shaking and may very well change the face and future of Guatemala. Named to Forbes 30 Under 30 list, and also a uh, Ashoka Fellow and a Mulaga Fellow, more of which you can read about on our website. He is most proud of the team and the partnerships he's built that are helping reach hundreds of thousands of Guatemalans with nutritious food every day as they strive to reduce malnutrition in the fourth poorest country on the planet. So you can help me out by pressing the subscribe button below or following me on Apple or Spotify podcast, I'd be grateful. So now please enjoy this conversation between myself and Kurt Bowen. So hello, Kurt, and welcome to How We Change the World podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Deborah. And I just learned from you that we are speaking to you. You're in Guatemala City right now, and this is where you live full time, correct? These yes, days? I've been in Guatemala for 13 years. 13. Well, we are going to go through a lot of that here in a minute. Um, anyway, it's really good to speak with you. We spoke quite a while. I interviewed you at length in about 2013 or somewhere thereabouts. Um, and so I, uh, I have a good idea of your background and, and, and what you've been through. But of course, people watching and listening do not. So um, I'd really love for people to understand the background uh in terms of how you started and, and what you've been through and, and where you've landed. But if we could start, I'm just for, just for starters, you are the founder and executive director of Semilla Nueva, which I, did I pronounce it properly? You did that. That's perfect. With a, with a real Colorado <laughs> twang, uh, which is, which is Spanish for new seed. And uh, which I hadn't really realized until just now was very prophetic because that isn't exactly where you started, but that's where you've landed. So we'll go through the process of how you, how you ended up with the work you're doing now. But anyway, um, well, maybe you could start by just describing the, the mission in general, what, why Simia Nueva exists, what, what's your purpose in being? Absolutely. You know, I think, for me, the mission really came down to an experience that I had, you know, very young. I was 18 and in Central America for the first time. And I went down to, to build a house for a family. And we finished the house. We felt super proud of what we'd done, you know, this, this life, this set of lives that we'd impacted so deeply. And then, you know, a lot of other people started coming up and explaining all of the things that they were struggling with. Um, and whether it was $400 for a surgery to save a relative's life or, you know, somebody who also needed a house and were six people living in a single room. Um, you just realize there's so much need. And we really wanted to figure out what could we do to not just hit that need from the front side, from like wherever need pops up, we'll, we'll answer it. Mm -hmm. But look at the kind of systemic causes. What is behind poverty? Um, what are the biggest reasons that so many people around the world are so poor? 
what can we do to, to most effectively fix some of those causes of poverty? And that took us to corn farming. Um, it's one of the biggest activities for the, the world's most extremely poor people, um, mm. Mesoamerica, Sub-Saharan Africa. There are currently, gosh, 53 million families around the world uh, growing corn on little one acre plots and, and wow. 1.2 billion people eating it three times a day. And so it's amazing. Corn ended up, yeah, it ended up being this piece yeah. that we could focus on. And for me, it was going full circle because I, I grew up on a small, a small farm. Uh, and I never wanted to go back. I had no desire to ever spend more time on a farm. And then it ended up being the thing that, that my life really started focusing on was, huh. Without That's so interesting. Farmers. So it's so interesting how our very, very early influences stay with us throughout our whole life. And you had all this knowledge that you gained just by living. You're from Idaho, a lot of potato farmers. You, you grew, you, you learned so many things just by osmosis. And, and, you know, I guess if you found that the things that you know are the things that can actually help the world, then, then why not use them, I suppose, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, and I think if anything, you know, it wasn't like I had like really good uh, knowledge of like soil chemistry or something like right. that. It was more kind of like my my mom's just constant drive to go try new things oh. uh, and like new ways of keeping soils healthy and growing more nutritious foods. Kind of your mom was doing spirit. that when you were a child? Yeah, she, she was obsessed. Oh, I didn't know like, that. Yeah. What were you growing? Absolutely obsessed. She grew every. She wanted to be self-sustaining. Uh, I see. You know, that ah, grow all of thickens. our own food. Okay. Yep. Yep. So that all very right. like Catholic social justice, uh -huh. uh, food sovereignty kind yeah. of thing is yeah. where I came from. Really um, interesting. Yep. Well, you started with just one farmer and now you're up to how many employees do you have? I think I saw 30 at one point on your website. Is yeah, there's about close? 30 people on the team and we're serving. Mm -hmm. Last year we served 18,000 families. It's incredible. And then you also have a board, a pretty large advisory board, and then this whole other board of uh, international scientists that are helping, that are working on developing a better grain. So just for the purpose of showing from whence you came to where you are now, because um, there's, there were a lot of steps along the way. Um, before we go too much into specifically the, the details of what you do at Semilla Nueva, how, like right now, the biggest uh, social problem, I guess, that you're that you're working with is malnutrition, right? That's like the key indicator. Can you talk about what uh, you know? A lot of people throw poverty and hunger and malnutrition. It kind of just all they roll together. But malnutrition <laughs> yeah. specifically is really has a very specific effect on on kids and on the world, as it turns out, on the whole productivity of the country. And so do you have some knowledge about specifically malnutrition, what its impact or lack, you know, when you, when you don't, when you are malnourished, how it impacts your life? Yeah, it's huge. And I mean, it's, it's interesting because we're finding that the future of malnutrition at the world level and the future of small corn farmers are basically going to be super tightly linked. They are now, and it's going to be much more so in the future. Oh, but to go back, like the malnutrition angle, um, yeah. you know, Bill Gates once said if he had a magic wand and he could only fix one social problem in the whole world, it'd be uh -huh. malnutrition because it's so hard to fix and it's such a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is it, it ends up actually being one of the primary causes of poverty at the world level and also the number one cause of childhood death. So kids not getting enough nutrients, kids getting sick and losing those nutrients. This is one of the biggest problems we have to face at the world level. Um, when a kid gets really sick, they normally lose the nutrients that they're holding onto in their body and they stop being able to absorb mm -hmm. them. And this is one of the biggest processes that leads to a cascade and leads to those kids not making it. This is a big deal in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, all over the place. So childhood death, huge, huge thing to be concerned with. Um, and malnutrition plays a key role there. Secondly, education. So you lose on average more than 15 IQ points if you don't get the nutrition you need when you're little. Mm. And that's 
massive. Pretty significant, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. was a big study in Guatemala they did where all they took these like 4,000 kids and half of them got like this high protein drink and half of them got a normal drink. And they found that the, the half that got the high protein drink, girls stayed in school 1.2 years longer. So just getting a little bit of nutrition to a little girl at the right time can make a complete change in what happens to her whole future. And, and by extension, the future of her family, her country, and even the planet as it all, it's, it's all related, right? It's all I mean, connected. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's also, I mean, it's, I think half of, at least half, I don't know the exact figure now the, of the ch- number of children in Guatemala who are malnourished right now, isn't it at least 50% or more? 46, and, I think is the last stat. So yeah, sixth highest close. rate on the planet. Yeah. One out of two kids. Yeah. It's, I think it's what, really high. And what I think a lot of people that I have actually not, I just have learned in the last few years, there's a lot of people who are malnourished, but maybe even obese. Like it's not necessarily related to hunger. You can be full and malnourished, right? Or full no, and, and overweight. Yeah. Yeah. And this is actually becoming the most common combination. Um, so mm. when you're chronically malnourished, mm-hmm. um, when your girth is stunted, which is the biggest bucket, that's the most, that's the most common kind of malnutrition. Physical now. growth is stunted height. Yeah. Yeah. Height becomes the issue. And so, you know, you walk around in, in Northern Guatemala, like this part of the country, especially how handy the average. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And, and yeah, the average height of a woman is like four foot six, four foot. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's because of this, the stunting phenomena, like Mm. you can see it in height versus age. And so they've done the USAID has done these crazy, crazy um, kind of like journalistic, things where they'll look at uh, family members who went to the States and the kids who grew up there. And mm-hmm. then they'll look at all of their oh. cousins and their brothers and sisters who didn't. And just the difference of an American diet versus the rural Guatemalan diet, you mm-hmm. can see a difference of like six inches in the kids. In one, like, in one generation, one, one family. Right there, oh, so it's immediately, uh, immediate impact. Interesting. Yeah. And okay. it's, it's fascinating to see, but I mean, the problem is if you're not growing in terms of height, it means that your brain is, is even worse off. Okay. And so yeah. this comes out to willpower. It affects issues of cognitive ability. And not only that, but the body reacts to not having the right nutrients when you're little by changing your metabolism. Mm. And so I think the stat is it, it doubles or triples your chance of obesity later on in life if you were stunted as a child. Mm. So and I know diabetes. Obesity. Yeah, yeah, obesity and diabetes and probably, and I think heart failure and a lot of other things. And the only thing, the things. Also, the other thing is that uh, when your cognitive development is impaired, then as a country, when you start taking half the country having that same problem, it's going to be very hard to solve the bigger problem of just developing as a country. Just if you don't have the, the health and the physical and mental ability if you're stuck in and that i guess that turns out to be one of the factors that keeps people stuck in poverty for hundreds of years even right it becomes almost a cultural phenomenon yeah so here's a crazy stat to like put it all under perspective yeah um the economists who've like actually really analyzed this their estimation is guatemala loses about 10 percent of its entire gdp to something okay 10 percent. so that's huge yeah it's basically i mean exports. if you like it's it, the it, whole export system it's it's remittances you know like the amount of money pouring what does in that mean then what does that mean what's exports oh like as I'm, in the the uh, the economic impact of stunting mm-hmm. is a similar sized headwind to the good that comes from exports Oh, okay. So okay. if you could just get rid of stunting, it'd be like doubling the amount of exports. It'd be like oh, doubling that's so the amount interesting. of is coming to, from, to Guatemala. Like the, the biggest growth in the economy could come from just fixing the social problem. Yeah, it's amazing. And I just think very few people are aware of that. I, I, I don't think most. Um, but so for some background, um, just to give uh, viewers and listeners an idea of uh, what you're because you, you're actually a social entrepreneur. I mean, that is what your title is, if you want to categorize it. Um, and uh, I don't know if you 
I don't think everybody understands exactly what that term is, although it's growing and, and um, I don't know, popularity is the right word, but I mean, more and more people want to be, they want their work to matter. You know, they want, they yeah. don't want to just have a paycheck. They don't want to just go through the, the, the stages of life without having some kind of meaning in it. So, um, and I think that, uh, well, let me, let me describe, if you don't mind, can I read that article? You put this in the, uh, I think it was the Huffington Post a few years ago. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. 2013 is a long time ago. Oh, I, so you may have changed, years. you might have, oh yeah, you might have changed your, no, uh, no. your tune. Okay. So what it says is, um, social entrepreneurs are just like normal entrepreneurs, except our goal is fixing big world problems. We don't measure ourselves by market share, the price of our stock, or the time to IPO. When we're successful, we won't have mansions in Silicon Valley or drive nice cars. When we're successful, we will have improved the lives of thousands or millions of our fellow human beings, which is quite literally exactly what you're doing. So uh, you that's why I say you are, by definition, a social entrepreneur. And um, I guess, is that, would you also call that your... Your, your life mission, your life purpose. I mean, is this, you're in for the, for the long haul this, you've chosen a very specific kind of life that is helping people as opposed to these other things we just, I just mentioned. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to hear those words again. Um, mm. Yeah. That's really, it's really nice to reconnect with them. Um, that's good. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's very much still, what we're trying to do. I think it's very much what I'm about. I think, you know, when I was 19, I found the word social entrepreneur on a, on the issue of the mm -hmm. website. And I was like, this oh. is so cool because it, it, it married the kind of social justice passion of my mom with the kind mm -hmm. of like tech entrepreneur geekiness and ambition of my dad. Oh, it wow. was like, how do you, how do you go find a new solution that can change the world and scale it, but do so for a problem that is abandoned by the world, um, that you're never going to make a bunch of money. It's not a problem that has a huge market. It's exactly the kind of thing that capitalism for the most part ignores or covers mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. But we live in a time now where there is such abundance. There's so much resources that if we can convince people who have those resources to invest in these kinds of missions, we can go change huge things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think makes me so proud to be an American is that we come from a tradition of marrying capitalism with social good. And so it's super interesting, right? Like I'll, I'll hang out with some of our donors and they're incredible business people, like business people who've yeah. made that's who's Massive funding these things. Yep, right. exactly. Yeah. And then they said, you ask them, okay, so you reached a certain level of affluence. What do you want to do with your life? What is the highest good you can mm -hmm. do with the last years you have? And they're like, I want to go help the poorest of the poor. And so to get to do that from the beginning, mm -hmm. to not have to go become a millionaire and then help the poorest of the poor, <laughs> but go do it right away yeah. and then work with those people to like, you know, get some support and funding to do it. It's, it's a really cool opportunity. Um, but I think to me, that article is pretty great. Yeah. 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 I'm glad that still resonates with you because I think it is easy when you're 10 years into a program. Uh, actually you started before that, right? So what year did you first move to Guatemala after college? 2009. Yeah. So you've been there. Yeah. You've been there quite a while. Um, and it, it's, it's, Oftentimes people start off as what I guess we'll use the term social entrepreneur, but it's very difficult. It's such a difficult life. I, I, I saw one uh, interview you did, and I don't remember where it was, but you said you got down to 120 pounds and you, you're living on, um, in fact, you were probably malnourished or maybe it was 125. I don't remember exactly. Were you, did you become malnourished living there? Uh, you I'll think? plead the fifth. I'll plead the fifth on that one. Ah, uh, mom's watching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, um, my light just turned off on me. Um, so, but you have, you wouldn't undo what you've done, right? You, you wouldn't change what you've done just because it's been 15 years of what was, I mean, a lot of it's been suffering, wouldn't you say? Uh, personal suffering at a per personal cost? Um, Not necessarily. You know, I, 
<laughs> it's funny. Um, behavioral psychologists talk a lot and, and sociologists talk a lot about um, sunk cost fallacy. I don't know that where, term. Yeah, it, so it means that you're so invested in something mm -hmm. that even though you should cut your losses and go do something else, you're just like, no, I will bring it across the finish line. Hmm. And, and what's interesting to me is that I think most of the time when people talk about sunk cost fallacy, they talk about it as a bad thing. Like taking oh. this like 1% chance that I'll yeah. actually be able to pull this off if I just give it another year. Yeah. But what's interesting is that to me, at least a lot of times, that 1% or 2% chance a year of actually getting somewhere, if you compound it enough years down the road, you actually mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. and oh, that's interesting you just yeah. have to have a longer time frame and yeah. I think one of the things are like my generation is so bad at is we're like I want I want my results in two years mm -hmm. I want my results in a year mm -hmm. and the things that really change the world are normally led by people who give it decades and or or who do work that has as a, the guy who started um, charity water says don't be afraid of work that has no end because yeah. it may not. You may leave this planet as an old man and there may still be huge malnutrition on the planet. But that doesn't mean, and hopefully maybe there won't be, but there will probably still be some because there's different reasons for it, right? I mean, we we have malnutrition in the United States, even though we have plenty. And sometimes people don't choose to eat foods that are not nutritious or whatever. So you may not be able to eliminate it, but but not to be afraid of the fact that it's work that never ends. I think there's a lot of power in that. I I fully agree. I one of my uh, best friends in, in undergrad quoted this author who said it doesn't matter if your goal is to contribute to literature or to art. It doesn't matter if you're one of the major rivers like a Dostoevsky or a Tolstoy or a tiny little mountain spring who writes a few things that very few mm. people read. The point is to contribute. The point mm -hmm. is to write. And I think with social good, it's I the love same that. way. Yeah, like I, I have heroes like uh, Norman Borlaug, who probably saved the lives of about a billion people between him and his team and the folks he worked with. Like there's a billion people alive today that wouldn't be. A billion? History would be, yeah, a billion. And, <laughs> and history would be completely different if he and his, his, his group and his funders and the governments he worked with hadn't been able to pull off what they did. I probably won't be a Norman Borlaug. And that's totally okay. The point is to give, to contribute, to live that kind of a life. And it has its own reward. Um, so I think we should still be super ambitious and try to like go do the big giant thing. Mm -hmm. But if you spend your life actually making the world better for the people that live here, and that is your high calling, mm -hmm. I think the quality of happiness that that you get is just immensely higher than if you're chasing the big house and the status and all those yeah. things. Yeah. And I think to be fair, and what I think what you're saying is that it's a lot what my guest last week was talking about and talks about frequently, Lynn Twist, is that we all have a role to play. And some of us have a very small role and some of us have a mere, very major role. And the point isn't any of it other than to just find what your role is. And and the, the people that are often funding like the work that you do, you're saying like, I mean, they may have chosen the, the Silicon Valley IPO lifestyle or, you know, or, or goal, a lot of them are also accomplishing really major things like, you know, coming up with new batteries for cars and, you know, all these other yeah. things. So, so it's not, I think I always want to be careful without making it look as though, you know, there's the good guys and the bad guys the people working for social justice and all that. And then the people working to chase the money, because it's not always to chase the money. Sometimes that money is a, a side benefit of, uh, being an engineer who works on new batteries for, you know, so, solar energy or something. So th that's just the, everyone playing their role, right? Playing the role that, that is right for them. And somehow it kind of, yeah, you're not buying it. <laughs> I think it's complicated. I mean, like, look, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I really like a lot of stuff in the effective altruism community. And, the, and there are people who have this idea called uh, work to give where it's like, go make a bunch of money and then give it to the things that, that change the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that there's a lot to say for that. I think that where to me it gets complicated is when you're contributing to a, a 
company or a, a, an organization that's overall on the world is, is a net negative. And I oh, think for that sure. we have to yeah. be, yeah, we yeah. have to be careful about that. Yeah, um, no, I understand. Yeah. But, but again, if the people that are f helping fund Simia Nueva are the people who've chosen that life, it's hard to argue that we don't need both sides of that equation, you know, hopefully yeah. they're not, hopefully they're not drilling oil and, you know, I mean, there's, maybe they are, I don't know. Or, and, and we can go down. So I know. <laughs> it's you, a rabbit hole. That is well, and a also hole. I'm well aware that you're a philosophy major in college. <laughs> so <laughs> that can really, uh, which, which really is, I think, explanatory of many of your, of, of how you live your life. Because you, that, if you start from a place of philosophy, it's going to underpin all of your life choices. If that's, if you're choosing it because it's what you really love. You said, I know before you said that those are the classes in college. Those are the only things that got you excited, which it really debate philosophy and, and discuss it. So it has definitely fed to your, to your lifestyle, I would think, and your, your life choices. So, um, but anyway, to, to return just a bit to, uh, ending malnutrition in, in, not uh, in the world, also in Guatemala. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about Samia Nueva. When you, when we spoke, what I, I guess that was 10 years ago, I can't believe it. But when we spoke then, uh, you were, you were looking more, you were looking at a lot of different things. I mean, there's been a long undulation of different um, efforts to end malnutrition or to, to find what the right piece is to the puzzle in terms of what your organization is going to focus on, right? Because I know you had talked about one of the first things was um, uh, like no-till farming, having farmers teach farmers how to do no-till, which has such a global effect because they were uh, farming corn and beans, but not replenishing the soil. And when it got so hard packed and unproductive and non-nutritious, they would start to cut down part of the rainforest. Uh, to do to use their as new fresh soil, and so I know that at one point you were really focusing on trying to teach farmers and get farmers to teach other farmers how to not let that happen and how to prevent that. Is that is that still part of the of the plan, or has that kind of moved over as you discovered other ways that were maybe more effective? To, to... Yeah, so I think we we started off and the first. So like the history of Semin Nueva comes in kind of these three phases. Phase one was us being really ideological and really, really naive. Mm -hmm. And I think actually causing problems for farmers. Mm -hmm. We came down and we're like, agriculture just needs to be organic. We can get everybody to go organic and like yeah. get the chemical companies. Like, yeah. I think a similar impulse to like what most 22 year olds or 20 year old undergrads in yeah. Like, good universities in America would do today. You know, like if you go to a liberal arts school, you might have that same idea. Uh, and we just really quickly realized that what we were trying to teach farmers was actually making them poorer. Ah. And we only had to do that once. That was one year. And we were like, okay, we're going to think <laughs> through this in a completely radically new way. And so phase two, which started year two, um, was we found this amazing network of scientists called the CGIAR system or center. And basically it's like a billion dollars a year spent on research to find the best new technologies for small farmers around the world. Hmm. And we said, cool, here's stuff that has a bunch of science behind it. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be able to see if it actually works for farmers because they'll have data and let's find the best ideas out there and try to bring them to Guatemala. And so no-till came from there. Um, oh, I see. Our work intercropping with pigeon pea, our use of green manures, uh, also our work with biofortified or, or even more nutritious corn seeds. Everything was kind of something that had been used by at least 10 or 100,000 families somewhere else in the world mm -hmm. that we had good reason to believe could make a huge difference for farmers in Guatemala. And we spent five years trying basically about five ideas and being like, what of these ideas has legs? what can we actually scale to at least a hundred thousand, if not a million people. Um, Before you keep going, when you say we, you were working with Guatemalan farmers. These weren't other Americans that you're working with, right? They were people that were actually from the, or were they both? Was it both? 
Yeah. Local so at the be when we first started, the only talent we could afford with $300 a month, which is like mm -hmm. what we were paying people, were like American volunteers. Uh -huh. uh, we, said, uh -huh. we used to joke that it was like two two meals of tortillas and beers and 10 beers a month. You know, like that was <laughs> that was like what we were paying people. Yeah. Um, and then as we got a little bit bigger, we were able to actually afford real salaries for mm -hmm. Guatemalans that had families and, you know, professional folks okay. and so yeah. we kind of grew into that um that was definitely part of our trajectory mm -hmm. but yeah it's, and we were working with a lot of guatemalan farmers and mm -hmm. we basic we had this philosophy called farmer to farmer that we had mm -hmm. borrowed from another organization it was just try things measure the results with farmers on their fields do the experiments together measure it together see what works yeah yeah and then have farmers train other farmers um and I think that that was really good because it forced us to be accountable to whether the interventions that we ideologically believed were actually what the farmers wanted. If a farmer doesn't take something and train a hundred other people and they don't do it and they don't keep doing it, mm -hmm. then you know that you're probably wasting their time. Regardless of what your purpose is, regardless of what your mission, if mm -hmm. you don't have something that's useful yeah. enough for them to do, you should yeah. change. Like right. you're wasting your donors' money, you're wasting their time. Like go and do you're affecting else. their lives. So so and you know, there's so much talk about um, white saviors, you know, coming to I don't yeah. know if you hear that term a lot. And I wonder, you know, I wonder if that's something that people talk about in the field. Like, do they resent you for um coming from another country and saying here this is what I'm, here's the knowledge especially when it goes wrong right like, especially when you say oh i'm bringing down this thing and it's like oh sorry now we're going to try this i mean is there a uh, a reluctance to follow you a reluctance to trust after things don't work out and or even a, a rejection of an outsider coming in and saying here's how here's how you should do it because I, I i don't know if that you're so personal and close to the people and such friends I know that happens with huge NGOs, you know, that there's, there's a resentment that kind of grows from people coming in, putting in a water, felt, water uh, source or something and, um, and then leaving. And then the people can't keep it up because they haven't been trained and so forth. So there was in the international development field for a long time, there was a lot of reverberation and rejection of NGOs coming in to help because of those reasons, you know, and then also almost like a, a an idea of superiority that we know more, more than you. Is that just to really put you on the spot? I mean, did those things happen to you as a very small integrated living with the people kind of NGO? Yeah, no, I think, I think the more years that you spend trying to figure out something that will be really beneficial to people in scale during your initial phases. If you're not finding that thing, essentially, I feel like you're incurring like a social debt, like you owe them more because you've mm. wasted their time. Mm -hmm. um, and even though you've wasted their time with the best intentions, if they have put their resources and energy into something that didn't pan out, and they didn't end up continuing to do, it's on you. Mm -hmm. Like the number one rule before anything should be do no harm, just right. like, you know, in the medical field. And right. I think that if you waste people's time, you're doing harm. Mm -hmm. And to, to me, it almost, you know, and maybe this is the, the good Catholic in me or the maybe the bad Catholic in me, like, I, I feel like you kind of absorb that guilt. You have to, if you're ethical. You have to kind mm -hmm. of like hold on to that and be like, I still owe, I, I owe something more because I tried and it didn't work out. Hmm. And so that becomes part, at least for me, of the drive yeah. to go figure it out and come yeah. up with something that really can make a difference and then take it as far as you possibly can. And I feel like we finally have gone far enough that I don't feel that kind of debt anymore. Like, I feel like we have made a huge net impact. Like if we look over the last, 13 years, what we mm -hmm. have done is like overall very positive. Um, but I think we have to run those, that math, you know, we have to be accountable mm -hmm. to what we did at the beginning. Um, even though it's hard. That's so to interesting. That. Yeah. That does sound like Catholic guilt. Having, <laughs> having suffered from it my whole life. Um, yeah. <laughs> I get it. 
but I, I certainly didn't sound like something you should feel guilty about. I just wondered if they had, uh, you know, if there was rejection on their part. It sounds like you, you've done a lot of internal soul searching around that, but I'm wondering what their, what the Guatemalan farmers, have they been, embra have they embraced you or have they not? Well, you know, I don't think it's it's about me. Uh, you know, I well, think it's a you, lot of your work. Your yeah. Simeon Nueva, yeah, not exactly Kurt Bowen all by himself. Do they still but... take my phone calls? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> luckily, I think most of the people we've worked with will still take take a call from me. But I mean, I think <laughs> I think that a... there was a lot of things we tried at the beginning that didn't work out. They didn't pan yeah. out. Um, right. People got really excited about it. My our our former board chair used to run Central America's biggest ag university um zamorano a mm -hmm. guy named dr keith andrews and he said something to me when i was like 23 that i just have held on to ever since um and he said central america has a history of incredible agricultural innovations that look amazing for two years and it looks like mm -hmm. you're starting a curve of massive adoption you're going to change the world yeah yeah and then they drop off and become nothing yeah and Why? so we had a couple of those um, oh. where it's like people get really excited and yeah. it's like, this is going to be amazing. This is going to change yeah. everything. Yeah. And then after like two years of them doing it, they're kind of like, this wasn't as good as I thought. This yeah. isn't worth the time and I'm mm -hmm. going to stop doing it. And we saw this with pigeon pea, you know, this bean that we were growing in between the rows of farmers existing crops where oh. the beginning of the curve was amazing. We went from like 10 families to like a thousand families and we're like, we have hit it. We've knocked it out of the park. This is it. And then people stopped doing it. And we had to say, oh, crap, what happened? Um, and it What was the intention being, of that bean? Like, what was, was that like to improve their nutrition with a new vegetable or something? Oh, or man, I feel like for me, talking about pigeon pea is like talking about like a failed old relationship, you know, oh, because like there was so much potential at the beginning. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but it was like there was so much potential and then it yeah. totally didn't pan out and so much disillusionment. But like the potential came because it was, <laughs> the idea was a bunch of farmers in Africa, like four or 500,000 farmers in Africa grow pigeon pea between their corn and in India, they'll grow it between their sesame. Huh. And in Southern Guatemala, where we started working, um, like this area right here, where I've spent most of my time, farmers grow corn and then they grow sesame. So you could grow it between both, like it was awesome. And the farmers in Africa and India grow this bean between their corn and sesame, and it doesn't decrease their yield. It rebuilds their soil. It's an extra mm -hmm. source of food for animals, and it's an extra source of food for people. So it's just hmm. like all the things, yeah. right? Like better right. for nutrition, better for the soil, better for economics. Like I was like, this is it. And what ended up happening was people didn't like the taste. Oh. Farmers have grown pigeon pea in Guatemala for hundreds of years, but they'll grow like 20 or 30 plants in the corner of their of their house and just eat it when it's green, like a green bean. Hmm. But to like let it dry, harvest the dry beans and eat them during the course of the year, it mm -hmm. tastes a little bit different. And even though mm -hmm. we spent years coming up with recipe books and training oh, and how nutritious so... it is, people are just like, it just tastes funky and I don't want to <laughs> eat it. And so we it thought we down. figured it out. And we didn't. And people mm -hmm. would do it for a year or two. And then they yeah. would like have that 50 pound or 100 pound bag of pigeon pea in their house. That they like wouldn't actually eat. And mm. after they went through a year or two of not actually eating it, they were like, yeah. this is not worth all the labor. Right. Yeah. And they stopped doing it. Yeah. Such so, a bummer. Take, so such a bummer. And I want to get you off your bad relationship and onto your, your current, <laughs> the current, current good, good one you're in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you have... <laughs> I'm really sorry to take you down that path, but it's important because I think, you know, the, the, the one thing we were talking about, maybe we didn't say the word was commitment that kept you going through all these things. Like you say, just like, you'll just keep going no matter what, but you, this huge commitment that you made to making their life better is what keeps taking you from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So I want to just acknowledge, like, that seems really, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's laudable. It's not an embarrassing thing. It's like, oh my gosh, it put so much into it. Didn't work. Put so much into it. Didn't work. Put some, I mean that you can take that failure and the, the constant like starting over again. I, I think this is so unusual and really the reason why you, you're succeeding now because most NGOs do pull out or, or fail or keep, I don't know. 
um, what you're doing is really, I think, remarkable. So, so let's talk about your good new relationship with is bio, is biofortification what you're, what, is that where we've landed sort of? Yeah. Or is it just corn seeds? I, and yeah. I think it's, it's hilarious that we're on like, you know, 35 minutes in and we're just starting to actually talk about yeah. the thing. It's been yeah. super fun. But... That's what happens when you're a philosophy major. You <laughs> Uh, super bad for marketing you know yeah. terrible for... and i'm the same way so i yeah it's not a good not a good combination for getting to the nitty-gritty but actually we are there now so bio Ford, so so tell us what's happened like how how you've arrived at what you're doing now because it's very very already productive and promising is that yeah, correct so yeah I, I i think we learned a lot from Pigeon pea. We learned that people care what food tastes like. Yeah. We learned that people don't really understand nutrition super well, and it's not a high high priority for them. And it's really hard to make it a high priority. Like if mm -hmm. if you're looking at spending your time and your money to like keep a roof over your head, keep your family fed, get your kids to school, nutrition is something that's so long term and so abstract right. that yeah. it just ends up being priority six or seven. Sure. Um, people are people like I don't floss my teeth as much as I should like we just I, I think that the question for me is like how do you make the right thing easy and beneficial and of all the things we were working on we found that the number one thing farmers wanted was they wanted either really really good seeds for cheap or they wanted really really good fertilizer for cheap and we had no idea how to do the second one, but the first one we thought maybe we can take seeds, corn seeds that have the nutrition that kids need and breed them to have the yields that the farmers really, really want, and then find a way to make those cheap enough that farmers can actually afford. So three so separate those, things, actually. Yeah. Three yeah. Changes. Marry those three things in. Yeah. Um, nutrition, yield, and price. And if you can do that, you have a way of helping those 53 million farmers who feed 1.2 billion people around the planet, not only get themselves out of poverty, but help those 1.2 billion people get out of malnutrition. So it's a huge potential impact and the devil's always in the details, mm -hmm. but about six years ago, we said, we're gonna close down everything that we're doing and we're just gonna focus on that question. Um, and, you know, fast forward and we have uh, a team of like 10 people that all they do is work on making seeds more nutritious and higher yielding. And we mm. work with some great scientists who help us do that. We sell really high yielding, more nutritious seeds to farmers at very, very low prices. And we're actually subsidizing other local seed companies like family seed companies to do the same thing. Um, and we're working on expanding to El Salvador this year, Honduras the year after that, mm. and eventually East Africa. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So bef before you keep going, just to explain that to somebody who's never heard anything about it, I think one of the things that's really important that you obviously landed on, which seems like the most obvious, but it's not until you go through all the failures and the different steps, is that people <laughs> are not, I mean, it's just the cell life, it's, but people are not going to change hundreds or even maybe thousands of years of culture. They eat yeah. corn, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the corn and, and beans, I guess. And they make tortillas out of corn and they make it, they know how to cook it, prepare it. It's a no brainer. And so it just makes great sense to take the very thing that they're already living on that they're not going to change in for a very long time, if ever, and make it work. Right. So that's, I mean, to me, it's, it's brilliant if you, because you did get the corn now to increase tremendously in terms of nutrition, right? Like in a lot yeah. of different areas. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so, and we were able to work with some incredible scientists who, who were able to find seeds already in nature that had those higher levels of nutrition. Ah, good point. And so that's been really, really cool. Um, most of the countries that we care about don't allow GMOs. And so you need to have, if you're going to do something like make corn more nutritious, yeah. um, it needs to be based in kind of genes that already exist in corn. So where were they? Where did they exist? Where are these farmers? Are they in Guatemala? I'm not farmers. The scientists are they in Guatemala, or is this a worldwide? Yeah, that, well, that works well, that I was mentioning. Scientists. Yeah, so yeah. the the hero that I mentioned, Norman Borlaug, he's 
he was one of the big folks behind the Green Revolution. And a lot of his work got turned into this big center in Mexico called CIMIT. It's an international uh, corn and wheat improvement center. Mm -hmm. And CIMIT has worked for decades on trying to do this. And they had some really great seeds hmm. that had really good nutrition. Okay. Um, and they were coming up with better stuff all the time. And, and I was lucky enough that at 22, I just took a bus to Mexico City and stumbled into a couple of scientists' office. You know, this like <laughs> ragged looking 22 year old straight from Guatemala. And they Who spend... stumbles into scientist's office. <laughs> yeah, you there's a be... little. There's a little bit of intention behind that. I have a feeling. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a couple buses to get there. It was like 27 hours. It was a while of. Yeah. Uh, but sounds more and, like. And, it. <laughs> and they got excited. They were like, "Oh, cool! Uh, you want to do yeah. some good stuff in Guatemala? Here's what yeah. we're doing. Go try it." And so we were able to start working with their seeds back in 2012, and. Um, you know, the big question was, there's this incredible science out there. How do you get it to farmers? Mm -hmm. And that really became kind of our role is like, let's try all the seeds that are available. Yeah. And then now we have our own team who's also working on making them better here in Guatemala, which I think is really important. Um, but it was working with folks who kind of already done the work. So, yeah, which was something you had said uh, when we spoke a long time ago that you the ego really has to learn. You have to learn to have your ego take a back seat and, and understand that if I'm, t I'm giving you back all your useful wisdom to you. <laughs> like, oh, I forgot that one. Um, but the uh, other people have a lot of knowledge that you need to draw on and to, for collaboration. Like if you are trying to be a leader and you're trying to be a, especially in the world of social entrepreneurship, you know, you, uh, at some point you have to say, Oh my goodness. If, I only know a little bit and it's all these other people. It's just a matter of pulling together the, the intelligence and the knowledge and the wisdom and the experience, I guess, of all the, all the available people. So that sounds like that's where you ended up is, is doing that using the, the knowledge of scientists who've already started. So, so what I, one thing I read is that the, uh, one of the reasons that the malnutrition is so, so poor in like corn eaters or at least in the corn that they were eating, um, was that they're missing a zinc and they're missing iron and they're missing a good quality of, uh, of protein. And so by improving all of those, I mean, you've done that now, or they've done that and you've used the seeds and um, the, I mean, is it measurable? Like, the, is it changing the actual malnutrition rates or is that something that takes decades to, to observe? It is really hard. To study that a good a good trial that measures increasing height in kids mm -hmm. to get the statistical precision to be sure that it's your corn or your intervention that's doing it mm -hmm. takes enough kids measured for enough time that the study costs like one or two million dollars it's just expensive so we haven't been able to do a study that big yet mm -hmm. although we're hoping that um a new collaboration with the U.S. government will allow us to run a study that big. That's interesting. Which is cool. Yeah. In the meantime, yeah. what we have done is we've been able to model how much nutrition kids are getting. So like our, if you go to their house and mm -hmm. you look at pregnant women and lactating women and little kids mm -hmm. and you take a notebook and you measure exactly what they eat every single day and you weigh it, you can get a pretty good idea of like what they're eating on a daily basis and what's missing. Mm -hmm. And then we can calculate how much additional nutrition um, they're getting from our corn. And we've had some really good results, like with zinc, where, you know, 64% of the mothers who were not getting enough zinc in their diet were able to get all the zinc they needed just by switching to our corn. So it's like, like that's things. amazing. And eating yeah. the exact same food every exact day. Exact same food, exact same and way. How, how does the taste uh, compare? Can they tell? Is it a different taste? They like to taste better. Uh, the oh, improved really? protein actually makes the tortillas uh, softer. Uh, it really? makes them last longer. So women are actually don't have to cook at twice a day. They can just make their tortillas once a day, and they stay like oh. like you know good tasting yeah. for the whole day. So yeah. there's a whole bunch of benefits, um, which have been awesome. To see. So are are these rural people mostly that you're working with? Or 100 percent rural, and not just work, not just. Um, working with to grow, but also the recipients of that corn is, is it mostly rural or are there 
things going on in the city as well, like people purchasing that coin live in the cities. Yeah. Do you know? So, so we do. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, Eastern Guatemala, the Southern coast here in Northern Guatemala, this is where most of the corn is grown that then feeds the entire country. Um, and I guess if you're just listening to audio, you can't see me pointing at a map, so I'll oh. avoid that. But yeah, there's these kind of like little corn bread baskets um, or tortilla baskets, I guess you should call them. And we work with those farmers and then they grow using our seed. They're able to grow enough corn that they not only feed their family, but they also have extra to sell. And all of that corn flows into the little tiny cities or the big gigantic Guatemala city where it's eaten by really poor people there. So for instance, last okay. year, we had 18,000 farmers who produced enough corn to feed about 400,000 people, three meals a day for an entire year. So, Whoa, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the goal is to get close That's... to a million people fed this year. So like a big jump up. So you're really seeing really tangible results now. I mean, very measurable, tangible results. From yeah, work, in terms from what of, you've done. In terms of farmer income, like we survey the farmers who use our seeds and we find farmers who use our seed and still use their old seed and we'll like mm -hmm. measure the difference in yields and the, the difference in, in how much they're able to sell their corn for. And last year farmers made we, we're still finalizing the numbers. Um we'll have them within the next couple of weeks, but between two point three and two point seven million dollars of additional income. That's a lot for people who live on how few dollars a day a few dollars a day yeah most yeah. of our farmers are about three dollars a day so and and what was that number again the increased income 2.3 to 2.7 uh mil million so, yep for the country of guatemala which i wanted to just i wanted to say is at the beginning because i know there's a lot of people who actually do not know where guatemala is and i meant to say this at the beginning because <laughs> it might it might seem crazy to you because but we don't know where people are listening from and um, but anyway, just so people know, it's just it's directly beneath Mexico in Central yeah, Central America. Guatemala like, is Mex very... Mexico is Mexico. Yeah, it's oh, one uh, more down. That sounds like from an American perspective. <laughs> yeah, no, I've I've had to explain to a lot of folks back home in Idaho and you know yeah. like wherever I've been. But yeah, making just yeah. saying Mexico is Mexico. It's pretty easy. Yeah, <laughs> that that does make it easy. Embarrassing that that has to be the. <laughs> Uh, the way that we describe it, but anyway, um, okay. So, so twenty that mil, that many millions of dollars going into the hands of farmers in Guatemala is a game changer. Just yeah. that it, without the nutrition. So now without you've got po you've got poverty alleviation. You've probably got education improvements. You've got nutrition improvements. Um, how how is how does the government feel about this? I do work with them. They must be happy. <laughs> I mean, this is a this is a national impact. Yeah, and we're and we're hoping to grow it. I mean, I think the goal will be for next year for us to go from eighteen thousand families to over thirty, so nearly doubling in size. And my hope is that we can get farmers' incomes about four million dollars up. Um, so we just want to keep growing that. You know, I I think the government there's the government's big. I think everybody always thinks of government and they think it's like one organization and really there's a yeah. lot of different people. Yeah. Right. And there's a group of agricultural scientists called the, the ICTA that are in the Guatemalan government that we work with incredibly closely and have for over a decade. They mm -hmm. love it. We help them. They help us very mm -hmm. symbiotic. And then there's like the ministry of agriculture, which is like the big top, you know, works with the Guatemalan president. And with them, we're actually, we're working together on a project to, get some money from the US government for them to scale our work, um, for them to take it over. And basically for the Guatemalan government to say, any seed company who wants to do this can use these seeds hmm. and we'll pay them a little bit of money for every farmer they reach. Mm -hmm. And it'll be cool. Imagine if it's like, listen, That'd little be company, amazing. If, you, if you help a farmer increase their income 150 bucks, mm -hmm. we'll give you 15. Mm. And it looks like the math works out. It looks like this tiny subsidy to seed companies could become this massive it, impact wow. in terms of the poorest of the poor. Yeah. And so we already yeah. know that most, for the most part, giving cash directly to poor people is more effective than most social programs. But what if you had a way to do something that was 10 times more powerful than just giving them cash? 
I might I might have missed a point there. What are you doing that's ten times more powerful? You mean they're so if we pay a seed company about what we have right now is if we pay a seed company nineteen dollars, yeah, that seed company will take our seed, they'll grow it, they'll market it, and they'll sell it at a super cheap price to poor farmers. Nineteen dollars per what? Basically Just... per farmer. So okay, oh, so I the see. amount of seed okay. that an average farmer produces. Yeah, I see. We're yeah. like here's nineteen dollars of subsidy. The seed companies sell their seed at like basically half price. The poor oh, farmers who normally don't buy it, okay. buy it. Yeah, right. And then we I get see. that huge impact. Wow. Uh, nutrition and livelihoods, like yeah. economic and nutrition for each Just tiny, using tiny that bit. leverage. The leverage yep. is all about that. That's incredible. You know, I saw an article that Al Jazeera wrote sometime this year, uh, someone in uh, Al Jazeera published, um, that said that the people were really, that because COVID, that malnutrition rates really and hunger and poverty all really increased. And yeah. even because of Ukraine, this wasn't in that, that article, but I just know from reading somewhere else that uh, because of the war in Ukraine, that it's also really affected Guatemala. It's just so interesting how the world is so interconnected that we don't see. I don't know if you have noticed that yourself, that those, um, that, that both the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have affected the availability of food. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, I was really happy at the, at the UN General Assembly in September. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, the top ranking officials at USAID who oversee um, Latin America actually mentioned that what they think would be the best strategy to help the poorest of the poor who are most suffering would be working on making fertilizer more accessible and making more nutritious biofortified corn seeds more accessible. You're like, yes. And I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, let's work yeah. with you guys. Let's figure out how to do yeah. that. So nice. it's, it's, it's cool, but no, it is. It's super interconnected because as, um, you know, the biggest countries, some of the biggest exporters of fertilizer are Ukraine and Russia. And we don't oh, think about that, but no. for the average farmer, which a quarter of the folks living in Guatemala live on a corn farm. For the average farmer, the biggest cost they have of anything in their entire life fertilizer. is fertilizer. So if that huh. doubles or triples, it yeah, plunges goes... everyone deeper into poverty. And they're literally living on the edge. And like, they're living on the edge. So literally, day to day, not even week to week. Yeah. Well, that's that's fascinating. I didn't know about that. So what? So what is then your uh, your long term goal? Like, do you, is you, are, are you trying to work yourself out of a job still, or do you think you'll be there for, for the duration? Because <laughs> I think you went down the first year thinking you're going to stay for a month or something and yeah. do a lot of good and uh, my, to the calendar lately. But <laughs> my, my record on predicting how long I'm going to be in Guatemala is pretty shoddy. Um, <laughs> I think that's definitely yeah. the case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I've always thought it was going to be two or three years uh, yeah. more, and then... 13 sneaks up on you, but yeah, you know, I think right now we're at this incredible moment um, as a species where we're on the edge of some technologies that could just change everything. Hmm. And there's a lot of places where those technologies have a lot of corporate incentives, like a lot of profit incentives to be developed. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple places where they don't. Um, so we know that the combination of like big data, like if you read any of like Harari's work, like uh, Sapiens or Homo Deus, I think he frames it really, really well, where, where he says the, the future of humanity will be more different in the next hundred years than it's been ever. And it'll be this conflux of biotech and AI, hmm. the ability to change what life is and the ability to understand life well enough that we know what to change. And so I think what's fascinating is those two technologies also could completely change agriculture and they could change it in ways that allow us to fix some of the biggest problems for the poorest of the poor. But there's not, in a lot of cases, going to be any money to be made there. Mm -hmm. And what I want to focus on is the places where we can do that to help the poorest of the poor where there is no money. So, and I'll give you an example. If we can figure out exactly what genes control nutrition in a crop like corn, 
through gene editing, there's a way of turning those genes on, which doesn't technically count as genetic engineering because you're not taking a gene from say a bacteria and sticking it in corn plant. What you're doing is just activating genes that are already present in the corn. Plant. Okay. Okay. And if we can do that, it can bring the cost to basically make a corn variety have all the nutrition that a kid needs to be almost zero. Imagine if we could go, here's a way to just turn on all of the, the nutrition genes for all the corn plants that the poorest of the poor are growing, and we've made it basically free. Imagine if all the governments in Africa and Central America could just be like, and the, or the big companies themselves could just be like, sure, let's do that. And then boom, 1.2 billion people actually get the nutrition they need. It's, it would, yeah. And you're, you're, you think that's, a, that's coming. That's coming in, in the foreseeable future. I think I want us to do that. Oh, oh, well, that that's, is a goal. That's a goal. And, <laughs> and that is a goal. It, it takes a lot of work. And I think this is why it's been so cool that we're now doing a lot of the seed development ourselves um, because it allows us to gather the data and the genetics to be able to start learning how to do that. Um, wow. And so a big piece of our work is kind of like, on the day to day, it helps farmers make more money and help the poorest of the poor get better nutrition. But also, the more that we learn how corn genetics work and incorporate that in our work, the faster we're going to get to the point where we could hit that home run. What What is the effect of global warming having on the farmers, though? Is it there's a lot more drought it's, there, right? Huge. It's huge, and yeah, droughts, storms. I mean, we know yeah. that climate is one of the biggest reasons there's so much immigration to the States. Climate right. makes people poorer. And mm -hmm. those shocks, the big caravans of people came in a year of like horrendous storms where people feel the underwater. The caravans from, from, I'm sorry, where they did what? Yeah, the, from under, Central America, like Honduras and Guatemala, the right. big ones that came a couple years Going back. to the United States. Wait, yep. what did you say about being underwater? Farmers got hit by these two massive storms, Eta uh -huh. and Iota, and those massive storms led farmers' fields to literally be underwater for days. Oh, the fields. Okay. okay. All their crops that... are dying. Their houses mm -hmm. are underwater. And that's the moment where you say, okay, cool. Here's a bunch of people walking to the U.S. I yeah. don't have anything here anyways. I will throw on my backpack and I'll start walking. Yeah. That's the world that we've created. That's the world we have now. And the question okay. is, how can we come up with good things to mitigate that, to make it easier for those farmers to, to stay and build a life? I know the Guatemalans are the number one uh, most represented immigrant trying to get in at the southern border right now. So I think the implications just from Guatemala, it's tremendous in the U.S. And this is all over the world, right? So the yep. change is, is, is driving immigration all over the world. So I'm wondering, is there when you're working on these seeds, are you working on seeds that are drought resistant? Is that an option or, you know, can, oh, my other light's going up. So I say it's, it always tells me last call, either that or the electricity's flickering. I don't know. Um, but it, but it does always tell me what we should, we're approaching the end of the conversation. Um, and what did I just ask you before that little hiatus? Drought resilience uh, and storm yeah. resilience. Yeah. yeah. Is that, it's huge. That's, I mean, if, if your goal is to help farmers make more money with corn seeds, one of the best ways to do that is to develop varieties that are resistant to droughts and storms. Okay. And so that's essential. It's absolutely critical in everything that yeah, we do. Yeah, I would think, um, yeah. And it's so cool when you when you can actually see it. Like we had some photos that we put on one of our, our calls for everybody a couple months back or even one over Christmas. And you can see mm -hmm. a, a full field that had our seed right next to a full field that didn't. And it's actually the same farmer. It's, you know, he grew okay. seed on half and normal seed yeah. on the other. The other seed was all blown over by the wind. The corn was on the ground rotting and ours was fully upright drying. And so it's so cool to be able to see that and like go visit a farmer yeah, and say, it's... we're eating this year because of this, because of what you guys So did. tangible. And that's so something tangible. that's so hard to, to get. Like you said, it's so hard to me measure nutrition differences, but then just like, oh, just look at it. Yeah. That's very exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah. How, how can, um, if people want to follow you, if they want to help you, if they want to volunteer, what, you know, how, what do you, what do you need from people and how can people help you help your organization? 
I mean, I think there's some really, so number one, like we, we always, we are a nonprofit. So mm -hmm. you can make a tax deductible donation or, or connect us to a friend. Actually, one of my really close friends at a wedding a year and a half ago is like, oh, I, I know somebody who works at a, a foundation that does some work in Central America. Do you want to, me to put you in touch? And yeah. they, they did that. And that one email helped us reach an extra thousand families per year over the last two years. Just one tiny little introduction. That's interesting. That's really so, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Putting us in Connect touch with folks. Connections. Can make a yeah. Huge difference. Um, donations makes a huge difference. I think one of the big things we really need to do is come up with a better way to tell our story. I think the last 10 years or so, I've been pretty quiet. We haven't been doing a lot of interviews. Uh, Deborah, you're actually the first one I've done in a long time. Um, I'm honored. I, yeah, no, the first one in English, yeah. maybe like half a decade. Uh, I saw a CNN interview, but it was in Spanish, which is fine because they had subtitles. But yeah, yeah. English, English would help, yeah, for a lot of Well, and even that one, that was beginning of 2016. That was seven years ago. Oh, yeah. So You're not just, out there. Yeah, We're not out there. Yeah. And we haven't been out there because I, I think we've all been focused tooth and nail on like figure the thing out. Yeah, yeah. And now that we have, now it's just a question of raising enough uh, money to reach more and more people. I see. And so this is the moment where I think if there's ideas for other interviews, that could be super, super helpful. Fantastic. Well. Sure. Yep. And anybody sure, who knows goodness. about crop genetics and wants, wants to come spend six months in Guatemala, like uh, we've had some so, great undergrads from Iowa who've come down and done internships. We're definitely looking for that now too. Uh, we have a beautiful farm that people have lived in and like done some great work on, on the crop development side. Oh so goodness. graphic design, marketing, or crop development, any students okay. who want to spend at least three months with us, uh, let us know. We can, we can put you at the farm, which is one of my favorite it, places in the world. Where is it? Is it, in, is it near Guatemala City? Uh, four hours or, southwest. Or not. Yeah, oh. so you're 40 minutes away from a, an ocean with bathtub temperature waters. Okay, now nah. there's your marketing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It is uh, January in Colorado where I am, so uh, and it has been looking. It has not melted for some reason for weeks. So I think that's your uh, eighty-eight that, that's degrees it. and bathtub okay. water. <laughs> Don't have to torture. It's to just say. In, yeah, just enticement. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I will definitely spread the word as much as possible. It's really helpful to hear those little things. Like I mean, they're, they're kind of like almost throwaway lines, but ne needing help with graphic design or getting more, getting your word out, just connections. I think that's fantastic, as well as obviously donations. And and we'll put the um, show notes. We'll put all your information on show notes. But um, yeah, I would uh, I would love for a lot of people to to find out about you and. Yeah. I'm really sorry that that light is flashing. I can't no, don't worry, figure out what don't I, <laughs> well, I mean, it, gives me, it gives me time to remember that I should probably mention that people can like, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, yeah. Twitter, whatever, LinkedIn, yeah. look up to me and Weva. That's S E M I L L A space N U E V A or, um, yeah. me like Kurt Bowen. I think my Twitter is Kurt T Bowen. So yeah, pretty easy to find. Okay. I'll put it all, I'll make it really accessible for people just even in the social media ads and also in the uh, show notes on the website. So, awesome. um, so look for more from Kurt Bowen and company <laughs> and not, not company and Samia Nueva. It's been wonderful talking to you, really fun. And uh, I'll definitely spread the word as much as I can. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Absolutely. And, Looking forward uh, to doing this uh, yeah, a little bit sooner for the next time. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Good to see you. All right. Bye-bye.